Okay, so here in our study of the Lamrim, we have reached the topic of refuge. The way that we reach here is, first of all, by going through the presentation of how to properly rely on a teacher. Once you properly rely on the teacher, the teacher will urge you, will motivate you. So what the teacher urges you is um, to actually engage seriously the practice of Dharma. So they say, you have now obtained this precious human rebirth that is very difficult, very rare to find, and you must make it meaningful, achieve something meaningful uh, for this life and future lives. Although you have obtained this precious state of rebirth, this is uh, an impermanent, uh, like like so many other things, uh, this life uh, deteriorates. It is impermanent. It disintegrates uh, moment by moment. And uh, by thinking about death and impermanence, we start uh, seeking for a good rebirth in our next life. Now, this um, reality of death is something that applies to all humans. We know that we all have to die, but we cannot say with certainty exactly when is our time of death. After we die, there are only two possibilities. Either we will achieve a good rebirth or a bad rebirth. And if we fall into any of those lower migrations, we will have to experience intense suffering for thousands and thousands of years. And once we experience that intense suffering, there we have no opportunity to practice Dharma. Forget about practicing Dharma. You won't even remember um, Dharma at all. It won't even come into your mind due to the intensity of suffering. Therefore, having presented the suffering of the three lower migrations, the aim here uh, is for us to consider that, oh, if I were to be reborn in samsara in the three lower migrations, that would be unbearable. It's really terrifying. So the reason for that is to generate very strong fear. And then when we combine this fear with uh, faith and trust for the three objects of refuge, then we can go for proper refuge. Because the main thing here is, the main message is that we... Um, amassing wealth or working towards uh, building up one's fame, one reputation and so forth are things that are not useful at the time of death. The only thing that is useful is pure Dharma. Therefore, we need to practice pure Dharma. And the first step for that is to go for refuge. So we need to recognize the three objects of refuge, the Buddha jewel, the Dharma jewel, the Sangha jewel, and understand that there is a pathway, there is a method for escaping these three lower migrations and practicing pure dharma. Now, it's very important here to reckon, to understand what we mean by practicing dharma. We're on the 21st century, and we should not apply what was accepted earlier on as, um, you know, let's say in Buddhist societies or in various Buddhist countries. There was this idea that practice Dharma means to go to the temple and recite a few prayers. If you just did that, that was enough. You were practicing Dharma. We're on the 21st century and we should use our intelligence. And we very clearly, we understand that this is not enough. We need, first of all, to um, rely upon a teacher. And whatever the teacher teaches, we need to listen. We need to reflect. We need to meditate. Just as the masters, the great Nalanda masters, the, the masters of the Nalanda tradition have indicated, we need to use our intelligence to analyze in order to find certainty. Mm -hmm. well, the, um, refuge is a very important subject. So if you look at all the teachings of the Buddha, the 84,000 uh, bundles of the teachings, and if we see at all the teachings of the great Mahasiddhas in India and so forth, the essence of those things is refuge and bodhicitta. Awesome, no? mm. So it's uh, when we talk about Buddhist dharma, becoming a Buddhist and so forth, the most important thing, the first step is to establish refuge. Uh, we take refuge in this path because we say it's a superior path, the path of bodhicitta. But when we say I go for refuge to the Buddha, I go for refuge to the dharma, I go for refuge to the sangha, where is this refuge? Do we have refuge? We need to identify that very clearly. So, for example, is the statue of the Buddha, the body of the Buddha, is this refuge? Is the recitation of Dharma words refuge? 
is practicing generosity, supporting the Sangha and so forth. Is that refuge? So these are very important questions because we need to identify correctly where is refuge? What is refuge? So things such as a statue of the Buddha or the recitation of some mantras and so forth, these things do not con constitute refuge. Having looked at the suffering that is involved in the lower migrations and samsara in general, we generate fear for that, for that type of suffering. And then we have the faith of belief that the object of refuge can protect us from that. So that faith of belief that they have the power to protect us, which is mental awareness, this is what refuge really is. So things such as, for example, making prostrations or reciting the verse for going for refuge, this is called um, so sort of like the common or the ordinary refuge, but the real refuge, real refuge is awareness, is internal awareness. Also, the objects of refuge, the Buddha jewel, Dharma jewel, Sangha jewel, are not refuge themselves. They are the objects of refuge because the real refuge is the faith that we have towards the objects, right? So the thing that protects us is our faith. Also, when we talk here about refuge, uh, refuge indicates protection. And uh, of course, there are many cases uh, where we find instances of protection. For example, the parents protect the children, right? The parents give rise to the children, and especially when they are in, uh, during the young age, the early years, they raise the children, they protect the children, and so forth. For example, if the parents did not protect the children, it will be very difficult for those children to grow up properly. So this is one level of refuge, one level of protection that is offered. Another level or another type of protection is protection that you can buy with money. Like for example, you can have a bodyguard, <laughs> you pay someone to protect you, or in the shops, they have guards, isn't it? So again, these are paid to offer protection, but these are not what uh, they what we indicate with uh, the notion of refuge or protection in buddhism so the refuge as it is uh, understood within uh, the small scope of the lamrim is as presented in the seven seventy stanzas of reasoning by master chandrakiti that says uh, i uh, seek, uh, seeking um, the ultimate goal, I always go for refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So here is talking about an individual who is seeking the state of liberation and omniscience, and with a fear for the suffering of the three lower migrations, seeks refuge or finds refuge in the three objects of refuge. So it's important now to look at each one of the three jewels, the objects of refuge, individually. There are some who might think, well, it's very good for those bodhisattvas who have progressed along the path and then uh, they become Buddhas. That's very fine for them. But here I am experiencing so much suffering and it doesn't seem like they protect me or they help me. Now, one might think in this way. The thing is that if we do not have that necessary faith, which uh, means that we entrust ourselves 100%, then it is difficult to receive that level of protection. And you can also see this in society, like in, in our human-to-human -human interaction. If you 100% entrust yourself to somebody else, the way that they will help you, the way, that, the way that they will protect you is different from when you are, like, let's say, lukewarm or not sure and so forth. So um, then in terms of... Uh, let's say, the order of appearance of uh, the objects of refuge. In general, externally, we say that first the Buddha appears. So that being practices uh, accumulating merit and wisdom for three countless great ends, then uh, uh, manifests the state of enlightenment in Bodhgaya. And then the first activity was the activity of turning the wheel of Dharma. And from that, many bodhisattvas and arhats and so forth appeared. So you see in that presentation, first the Buddha appears, then he gives teachings of Dharma. So first the Buddha, th then the Dharma, and from that arise bodhisattvas and uh, other members of the Sangha, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. However, when we examine it from the point of view 
of our perspective, our own practice, the way that we present this is the causal of objects of refuge and the resultant objects of refuge. So the Buddha who is giving teachings right now um, is our causal refuge. And uh, the Sangha, whether it is Bodhisattvas or various um, teachers, those who help us, you know, on the path, they are the causal Sangha jewel, all right? And the Dharma that we received is the causal Dharma jewel. But the real refuge, the real protection is what we will achieve in the future, which is the resultant refuge. So the resultant Buddha, when I become a Buddha, the resultant Dharma, the resultant Sangha. So the, those who became Buddhas in the past actually do not belong in the same continuum with ourselves, isn't it? Because they are a different continuum, they are the cause of refuge. But what we, we will achieve through our practice in the future, right? When I become a Buddha, this Buddha that I will become, that I will achieve, and the Dharma and the Sangha that I will achieve, these things belong to my continuum. And therefore, they are the resultant refuge that really protect me. So from the point of view of how this, the resultant ones, are generated within my own mind stream, my own continuum, is that, first of all, I generate the Dharma jewel. Why? Because I listen to the teachings of my teacher and uh, I reflect and I practice and I meditate and I progress. This is the first thing that I establish and I progress from the path of accumulation to the path of preparation to the path of seeing. Um, and then from the path of seeing onwards, I start applying real antidotes and I abandon the afflictive obscurations and so forth. And therefore, I become, I would, the second thing that I will establish is the Sangha jewel. And then the Sangha jewel also will continue practicing the path of seeing, the path of meditation. So continuing to abandon antidotes and even abandon all the knowledge obscuration. And then it will become that Sangha jewel will become the, the Buddha jewel. Uh, so the order of establishing in my own mind stream is uh, first the Dharma jewel, then the Sangha jewel, and last one, the Buddha jewel. Then in terms of um, refuge, we can identify the refuge in the context of the small scope, the refuge in the context of the middle scope, and refuge in the context of the great scope. So for the refuge in the context of the small scope, you're thinking about yourself, you look at the suffering that is involved in the three lower types of migration, you generate fear for that, and then you have the faith that the objects of refuge can protect you from uh, that type of suffering of the three lower migrations. So in this context, the real refuge, the real thing that protects you is ethics, morality, the morality of abandoning the 10 non-virtuous actions. If you abandon the 10 non-virtuous actions, you will not be reborn in the lower three lower migrations. Then if we look at the refuge in the context of the middle scope, uh, you're looking again, still looking at myself. Uh, this time I am afraid of the suffering that is involved in the entire samsara. And I have the faith that the objects of refuge can protect me from that. So I establish refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. From those three, the real protection comes from the, again from the Dharma. And in this case is the truth of cessation and true path. So uh, these are the two things. Uh, the truth of cessation is abandonment. And once you have abandoned certain things, you obtain a path that is a true path that has this abandonment. Now, when we come to refuge in the context of the great scope, we are not just looking at ourselves, but we're looking at all sentient beings who are as vast as the vastness of space. And we see all of them suffering the various types of suffering in the whole of samsara, and also they suffer due to knowledge obscurations and so forth. We generate compassion towards them, and we have the faith of belief that the objects of refuge can protect everyone, all of us. So in the context of the great scope, refuge is, must be influenced by bodhicitta. 
Okay, so that was a general presentation and we can now follow the presentation, the traditional presentation we have in the Lambrim. In terms of refuge, we have four main outlines. The first one are the causes for going for refuge. The second one is identifying the objects of refuge. The third one is the manner in which you go for refuge. And the fourth one is having gone for refuge, uh, certain training or commitments that you have to follow. Mm. Okay, so we're on the section of taking refuge. What are the methods to cut off the paths to lower rebirth? These are awareness of the danger of the suffering of the lower rebirth, rebirth as explained above, recognition that Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha have power to protect you from such rebirth, and generate awareness of danger by means of meditation, and then take refuge in the three jewels from the depths of your heart. So uh, this very important question is raised at the very beginning. What are the methods to cut off rebirth in the lower migrations? Does any of us have the confidence to say, I will not be reborn in any of the lower migrations? No, nobody has this confidence. Because the thing is that every day we accumulate a lot of negative actions. So then what is the way to stop taking rebirth? So there are three ways here, or three means. The first one is, first of all, we must uh, um, be aware of uh, that suffering and have fear for that suffering. And then have faith in the three jewels that they have the power to protect us. And finally, wholeheartedly go for refuge. Okay, so the first of all, we have to recognize the causes for going for refuge. And we say there are two causes. The first one is fear of suffering. And the second one is faith, faith in the objects of refuge that they have the power to protect us. So we think that are considered important in society, such as always seeking after wealth and fame and reputation and so forth. These are not important things. And we have to generate this recognition that Samsara means suffering. And once we see all this suffering, we need to have proper fear, apprehension for the suffering of Samsara. If you don't have fear, you are not going to seek protection. You're not going to seek refuge. We see this in everyday life. If you're not afraid of a particular situation, you will not take any steps to protect yourself from that danger. If you don't perceive the danger, then you don't try to protect yourself from it. Also, the second thing with faith, if you do not have faith in the power of the one who is going to protect you, obviously you're not going to seek protection from that entity, that person or whatever it is, right? Even if you say, I will, I go for refuge, this is not wholeheartedly. And even if you do say these words, they are mere words, you don't really mean it. Mm -hmm. So we say that the first cause for going for refuge is having fear and apprehension for the suffering of samsara. This fear is not something that is caused by somebody else, like some another person caused you to be afraid of those things. This fear comes when you actually contemplate your own situation. Uh, we went through an explanation of what are the main causes that give uh, bring about rebirth in the hot hills, in the cold hills, um, as a hungry ghost, and so forth. So we see that engaging in the 10 non-virtuous actions becomes the cause to be reborn in the hot hills, generating wrong, view, wrong views and uh, uh, denying the existence of law of cause and effect and so forth, become causes to be reborn in the cold, uh, in the cold hills. Having a great uh, stinginess and miserliness become the causes to be reborn as a hungry ghost. And the thing is that in this life and our previous lives, we have been continuously accumulating this type of non-virtuous causes due to our self-grasping and self-cherishing. The way that we always act in society is like, uh, by whatever means, I want to um, have gain, and by every means, I want to defeat others. So if this is the way that we operate, it means that we have accumulated all the causes for lower migration. So this is where the fear comes from. The second cause is um, this uh, faith that we have in the capacity of the objects of refuge to protect us. Now, faith was something that we encountered earlier on, 
when we were talking about how to properly rely on the teacher. So we had that outline that says um, uh, train in faith, that is the root. And uh, we say that how we visualize the root guru, how, and then we proceed by making the seven limb offerings, prayer offerings, and so forth. However, um, the faith that we discuss here is the faith of belief. And the faith of belief comes from reasoning. You must have seen a reason that has generated this faith. And if you if faith is generated on the basis of reason, then it becomes very stable. So in this context, we must have understood the qualities of the objects of refuge. And that becomes the reason that generates the faith of belief that is then very stable. Stable here means it is enduring. It doesn't disappear straight away. And even when afflictions arise in our mind, afflictions do not destroy or, you know, over, in, uh, yeah, destroy or overwhelm our faith of belief. Okay, so we have covered the first one, the causes of refuge. The second one are the objects of refuge. The objects of refuge are the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha jewel. So whether um, or not you are a Buddhist depends on whether or not you have refuge. And... Um, the thing is that there are many other religious systems, but uh, most of them, of course, they, they have a main entity. Um, I don't want to, to use the word God, but usually they have one main entity that is the main entity of that religion. But um, they don't have this presentation of the three jewels that we have in Buddhism. We have the Buddha, we have the Dharma, and we have the Sangha. So that is unique in Buddhism. And the other thing in Buddhism which does not come from the English into the English translation. The term Buddhism implies internal, something internal. And what that means is that external activities of our body and our speech are considered to be common or indicative, whilst the real thing is what happens internally in our mind. So we see again the difference between Buddhism, that is an internal system, um, as compared to other religious systems that are external. They definitely uh, cultivate and emphasize going to the temple, making prayers, but this is mostly prayers for this life. You know, may I be healthy, may I be happy, and so forth. Okay, so Gesha says, I don't think that many of them have the prayer that says, may I reach the state of omniscience. So um, the thing is that um, by relying on uh, the, the, the bundle of the 84,000 teachings that Buddha Shakyamuni has given that were later clarified by the great Indian scholars and Mahasiddhas and so forth, there are many who internalize those teachings and reach the state of the Buddha, the Buddha jewel, the Dharma jewel, and the Sangha jewel. So if we compare our objects of refuge to the objects of refuge of other systems, so we see, for example, in other religious systems, um, people go for refuge to Indra or Brahma and so forth. Then these beings must have had some special qualities. We do not refute this. However, uh, they cannot be suitable objects of refuge from samsara because they themselves uh, are still within samsara. So if they are within the bounds of samsara, it means that they experience the suffering of samsara. So how can you go for refuge from samsaric suffering to someone who is also experiencing samsaric suffering? Also, although they teach dharma, they teach their own dharma, they give their own advice, they do not give instructions on how to obtain complete happiness and how to obtain the state of omniscience. So um, we have a story about this in the liberation in the palm of your hand. And there's the story of a family that uh, lived nearby a temple where they were practicing blood uh, sacrifices. So killing animals and offering the blood to the local gods, right? Unfortunately, this is uh, a practice of animal sacrifice that even these days in Nepal, is um, quite uh, widespread. Anyway, so the story is this. Uh, there was a family, the head of the family, 
um, actually was um, because they were living nearby that temple. Also, the head of the family participated and regularly did uh, those animal sacrifices. Uh, he was a trader and actually he was very successful. Uh, so they were wealthy. Everything was going well, well for the family. And that uh, the father, the head of the family, really thought that as long as I make those animal sacrifices to this God, everything will go according to plan, according to our wishes, and we will be well off and everything will run well. So even uh, he made a will that even at his death, there should be a blood sacrifice on his behalf. And after he passes away, that the family should continue to offer blood sacrifices. Uh, the reason why the father was successful in his business was due to karma, good karma he had accumulated in his previous life. But he made the mistake to think that it was a result of uh, animal sacrifices. Anyway, he passed away. And after passing away, he was reborn as a buffalo, as a cow, whatever, into this very family. And um, the son of the father uh, was continuing the tradition of the father of animal sacrifice. So he took the buffalo and sacrificed it to the deity, the local deity. So um, also there are many cases where various um, non-human spirits or hungry ghosts, uh, they might um, um, show a particular impressive aspect or uh, special powers and people are fooled and they go for refuge to them. Let alone uh, accumulating virtue, you will even lose whatever virtue you had previously accumulated if you make mistakes like this. Therefore, it's very important to clearly and properly identify what are the objects of refuge. So we say that the Buddha jewel is our object of refuge. The word Buddha in Tibetan is made up of two syllables, sang and ge. Sang means to purify, having purified. So here it refers to having removed and purified all the afflictions, all the obscurations, together with their imprints. So complete, total purification. And then the second syllable, the syllable ge, it means to expand, and it refers to expand one's knowledge to the point that the Buddha is totally omniscient, knows everything um, over the three times. Okay, so it is very important for us to uh, have the aspiration to make the prayers and also to engage in the practices that will establish the causes for achieving the state of a Buddha that has a body beautified with all the marks and signs. The next one is the Sangha jewel. So here, when we talk about Sangha jewel, these must be Arya beings. And uh, we can say that we have the presence of uh, the Sangha in a place if we have the assembly of four individuals who maintain pure ethics. So important thing when we talk about Sangha is that uh, the robes do not make the Sangha. Everyone can wear the robes, uh, but that doesn't make you a member of the Sangha. The Buddha has given a specific set of vows. So, for example, we have the Ginyan vows, we have the Getsu vows, the Long vows, we have Tantric vows, we have Bodhisattva vows. For someone to be Sangha, they must have the pure ethics and maintain the vows that come with whatever level of ordination, either the Getsu vows or the Gelong vows vows. So Geshe was saying, don't be fooled by anyone who is just wearing the robes. In the past, the earlier days, right, where people did not have much knowledge or awareness of those things, many people put on robes and they traveled to the West. And people took it at face value that whoever was dressed in robes was actually a proper monk. And later on, they realized that those were fakes. They were not real. So when we talk about Sangha, the Sangha are the ones who abide in ethics, in morality, the specific, specific vows. Mm. 
Okay, so uh, the term for Sangha in Tibetan is Gendun. It's again two syllables. The first one is Ge, Ge for Gewa, that means virtue. The second one, Dun, is for Dumpa, that means aspiration. So it's, uh, it's describing an individual who has great aspiration to engage in virtue, to practice virtue. So it's someone who engages Dharma uh, with great joy, with uh, great enthusiasm. Okay, so here also we must uh, understand um, uh, the differences uh, between um, Sangha and Sangha jewel, and also the Buddha jewel. So someone like Buddha Shakyamuni, he is the Buddha jewel, but he is also the Sangha jewel. Okay, so uh, the way that we present uh, the three jewels um, is uh, that the Buddha jewel is the one who teaches us refuge. The Dharma jewel is the actual refuge itself, the thing that protects us. And the Sangha jewel is the one who aids and uh, helps us in our practice. In terms of an analogy, when we see ourselves as the patient, we see the Buddha jewel as uh, the doctor the Dharma jewel as the medicine and the Sangha jewel as the nurse. So the Buddha jewel is the one who teaches the path, teaches the path. The Buddha is giving us advice like do this, don't do that. The same way that a doctor would say, oh, in your case, because you have this in this condition, you should do this or you should avoid that. Then the Dharma jewel is like the actual medicine, the actual thing that will uh, bring about the uh, improvement of our situation. So Dharma here is understood as the means or the method that uh, stops and removes improper states of mind. And um, the, finally, the Sangha jewel is, as we say, they are like the nurse, they are the Dharma uh, practitioners who also help us or support us in our practice. Once you generate the Dharma jewel in your mind stream, it means that you put an end, you stop the causes that bring about rebirth in the lower migrations, and you establish the causes for reaching the state of liberation and enlightenment. The Dharma jewel is uh, twofold, is the truth of cessation and the true path. Now, the true path begins from the path of seeing. So you know how we progress along the path, five paths, beginning with the path of accumulation, then you go on the path of preparation, then you obtain the path of seeing. So from the point that you obtain the path of seeing, at this point, um, you have direct realization of emptiness, you realize the selflessness of the person, so you obtain the true path. Okay, we also talked about the truth of cessation. So when you obtain the path of seeing, from that point, you generate direct antidotes. You need direct antidotes because there are quite a lot of things to abandon. For example, imputed self-grasping and so forth. And every time that you abandon one level of abandonment, you obtain what is uh, you obtain one level of the truth of cessation. So there are many instances of truth of cessation and these are permanent states because you have eliminated something for good okay so uh, we come to the third one the manner in which you go for refuge so the manner in which we go for refuge is by knowing the qualities of the buddha jewel the dharma jewel and the sangha jewel so we'll begin first of all with the qualities of the buddha jewel these are qualities of the body, of the speech, of the mind, and enlightened activities of the Buddha. So first of all, begin with qualities of the body of the Buddha. The body of the Buddha is the body that is beautified by the main marks and the secondary signs. Every pore of the body of the Buddha is uh, filled with Buddhas itself. Then we have the Ushnishna, the crown protrusion of the Buddha. These are special features uh, or the nails of the Buddha that they shine like copper and so forth. These are special features of the body of the Buddha. When we obtain the state of Buddhahood, we establish four types of body, the enjoyment body, the emanation body, the Dharma body, and the nature body. If we and talk about the bodies of the Buddha from or the qualities of the body of the Buddha from the point of, of uh, Tantra. 
Uh, we talk about uh, becoming enlightened in any of the five Buddha lineages. Uh, so we have the five Buddhas such as uh, Akshobhya, Ramasabhava, Amitabha, Amogasiddhi. Um, I'm forgetting one, but anyway. Um, then in terms of the qualities of the speech, the Buddha uh, talks with um, a speech that has uh, the 60 qualities. And it's a, a speech that is understood in the individual languages of those who listen. So if in the audience there are people who speak San Sanskrit, understand Sanskrit, they will hear the speech of the Buddha in Sanskrit. Those who are gods will hear the speech of the Buddha in the God language. Those who are uh, uh, Nagas will hear it in the Naga language. Uh, Non-humans will hear it again in their individual language. The reason why the speech of the Buddha is uh, like this, has these qualities, is because the Buddha is extremely skillful in means and has spent three countless great eons accumulating the causes that establish this type of speech. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have talked about the Buddha's uh, quality, the qualities of the Buddha's body and speech. Now, the qualities of the Buddha's mind, we have two. We have uh, the qualities of realization and the qualities of uh, uh, power and of and affection. So, first of all, when we talk about the, the qualities of knowledge that comes with uh, Buddhahood. We know that the Buddha has the five types of omniscience, such as omniscience of the eyes, the ears, and so forth. These are not considered uh, qualities of knowledge of the Buddha. The qualities of the knowledge of the Buddha are qualities that are developed as that being trains and progresses along the path. So as they progress along the path, their knowledge, their understanding increases more and more. So they come to the state of Buddhahood and they have a, a complete omniscience of all phenomena, meaning the variety, every phenomenon that exists, but also they understand the reality, exactly how all phenomena exist. Uh, and as a result, they have certain qualities such as the four types of fearlessness and so forth. Then on the other category, we see that because the Buddha has uh, completely destroyed and eradicated all afflictions, they are able to achieve the benefit of others effortlessly and um, spontaneously because they have uh, fully reached uh, they have reached the full power, full potential uh, from their own self. Okay, then uh, the last one was the qualities of enlightened activities. And in this, you can include every good thing that has happened to you is due to the enlightened activities of the Buddha. So, for example, the mere fact that we have the good fortune to listen to the Dharma is through the enlightened activity of the Buddha. Let's look at uh, the essence of refined gold um, again on page 13 after the three bullet points. How do the three jewels have the power to protect you from the terrors of the lower realms? The Buddha jewel is free from all fear. Being omniscient, he is a master of ways that protect from every fear. So uh, the Buddha himself has uh, free himself from every fear. And therefore, he can protect and free others from every type of fear. This is not something that is uh, that comes out of the blue without any cause. It is actually established in the very long practice over three countless great eons that uh, during which that being trains to accumulate um, merit and wisdom. So the Buddha trained during 500 impure lifetimes and 500 pure lifetimes in order to amass this accumulation. And as a result of this, he has reached this uh, full power where he can establish the benefit of others um, spontaneously and effortlessly. Okay, so continuing, as he abides in great compassion that sees all sentient beings with equanimity, he is a worthy object of refuge for both those who benefit him and those who do not. Be um, all right, so an important issue that um, comes here is uh, this attitude of complete 
uh, lack of partiality from the point of the Buddha. From our side, we have very strong partiality. We have attachment and we always favor those what we consider to be our people. And we have hatred towards those that we consider to be our enemies. This actually is uh, very predominant in society. And you can see that it creates quite a lot of um, problems and issues. Whilst the Buddha has complete uh, lack of partiality, doesn't have a notion of uh, these are my friends, these are my enemies, treats everybody with the same level of compassion. So from our side, if we were to consider that just as I don't want to experience any suffering and I only want to experience happiness, if I apply this principle, if I can just recognize that everyone has the same wish, then the way that we relate to others in society changes, right? So in this way, we can relate to others, we can communicate with others, we can become closer with others, we can support others, we can understand and trust others, which is a much better outcome. Uh, continuing from the text, because he himself has these qualities, it follows that his teachings, the Dharma and the Sangha established by him are also worthy. This cannot be said by the founders of many religious schools, few of whom were transcendental. Uh, so again, we mentioned before that a few religious systems take refuge in entities uh, of um, worldly of, of gods that are still within samsara, such as Indra and Brahma, we say that these are not suitable objects of refuge because they themselves are within samsara. Why would you go to them and ask them to protect you from the suffering of samsara if they themselves are not free of it? If you go for refuge to someone from samsaric suffering, you should go for refuge to someone who is beyond, who is out of that suffering of samsara and they can they have the power to offer you this protection okay so it continues um all right this cannot be said for the founders of many religious schools few of whom were transcendental or for many doctrines most of which are filled with logical faults or for many religious traditions most of which are fermented because buddha dharma and sangha possess these sublime qualities they indeed are worthy how do you take refuge in the three jewels chant three times i take refuge in the perfect buddha and so forth so you see here we talk about the recitation of i go for refuge to the buddha i go for refuge to the dharma i go for refuge to the sangha we have said that the recitation of these verses is only you can say external not external refuge but it's common it's not the real refuge okay the real refuge comes from a combination of two things. First of all, you must have real fear for the suffering, and then you must have genuine faith and trust that, that the objects of refuge can offer you protection from these fears. And with these two things together, you establish refuge, you generate refuge, and you enter the ranks of Buddhists. So um, what we recite is, I take refuge in the perfect Buddha. So this refers to going for refuge to the Buddha. Please show me how to free myself from samsaric suffering in general and from the lower realms in particular. I take refuge in the Dharma. So this is the second one, refuge in the Dharma jewel, the supreme abandonment of attachment. Please be my actual refuge and lead me to freedom from the terrors of samsara in general and in the lower realms in particular. So we have said that the real protection is dharma. At the moment, we have not generated real dharma in our in our continuum. But when we abandon our afflictions, such as our attachment and hatred and ignorance and so forth, then we will have that dharma, we will have that protection. Finally, for the Sangha, I take refuge in the Supreme Sangha, the spiritual community. Please protect me from the misery of samsara and especially from the lower realms. Whilst reciting these lines, generate a natural sense of taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha from the depths of your heart. So this is what we have been stressing. It has to be genuine, not just recitation. As we said, Dharma, uh, sorry, refuge is understood in three levels. Refuge of the small scope is in relation to fear 
that we have for the suffering of the lower migrations and then the belief that the objects of refuge can protect us from that. Then we have refuge in the level of the middle scope, where we have fear for the suffering of uh, the entire samsara and faith that the objects of refuge can protect us from that. And then refuge in the great scope, uh, which is uh, in terms of all sentient beings fearing the suffering of uh, different types of obscurations and knowledge obscuration, and knowing that having the faith that the objects of refuge can protect us from that. Okay, so the fourth um, outline is the precepts, the training that you maintain having gone for refuge. So continuing to read from the text, however, having taken refuge, but then not observing the refuge precepts is of very little benefit. And the power of having taken it is soon lost. Therefore, always be mindful of the precepts. So the importance here is once you go for refuge, you have to maintain the precepts. Because if you keep uh, breaking those precepts of refuge, there is danger that your whatever refuge you have generated, it will decline. So first of all, having taken refuge in the Buddha, no longer rely upon the worldly gods uh, such as uh, Shiva and Vishnu and see all statues and images of the Buddha as actual manifestations of Buddha himself. So once you recognize the qualities of the Buddha and go for refuge to the Buddha, you then do not go and also go for refuge to worldly gods and so forth. Also, you have this proper recognition of the every image of the Buddha as being the actual Buddha. Then, having taken refuge in the Dharma, do not harm any sentient being or be disrespectful towards the holy scriptures. So very important advice. The main precepts when you have taken refuge into the Dharma is to abandon cruelty and harm for others. And the third one, having taken refuge in the Sangha, do not waste your time with false teachers or with uphill, uh, unhelpful and misleading friends and do not disrespect saffron or maroon clothes. Now, having given those precepts, it doesn't mean that we cannot befriend non-Buddhists. We can be friends with non-Buddhists, but what it means is we do not go for refuge to their gods, right? You can be friends with those who go for refuge to, as it says here, the Vishnu and Shiva, but you don't go for refuge to Vishnu and Shiva. Okay, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in number three it says having taken refuge in the Sangha, do not waste your do not waste your time with false teachers or with unhelpful or misleading friends, and do not disrespect saffron or maroon cloth. So this refers to the robes of the of the ordained. And um I guess I would say we mentioned at the beginning of the session that not everyone who wears the robes is actually a genuine member of the Sangha, and we have to be aware. Uh, however, the you know there there is genuine sangha and the genuine sangha is dressed in those uh, saffron or maroon robes and therefore we need to show respect for uh, the robes of this of the genuine sangha. Okay, the next point number four also understanding that all temporary and ultimate happiness is a result of the kindness of the three jewels. So here, uh, temporary happiness refers to what we experience day by day and the ultimate happiness obviously is the happiness of uh, the state of omniscience. So whatever amount of happiness, whatever type of happiness we have is the result of the kindness of the three jewels. So having understood this, offer your food and drink to them at every meal. Okay, so this is a very important point of uh, offering the first portion of anything that we eat or drink. There are specific verses for reciting and dedicating that uh, first portion of the food. But even if you do not recite uh, these words in your mind, if you say, I'm offering this uh, first portion of everything I eat and drink, and may this become the cause for me to quickly reach the state of enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. Uh, so then if you think like this, if you dedicate like this, then offering this first portion of your food and drink becomes uh, the cause for accumulating vast amount of merit. So it is a very important practice. Also, uh, it continues by saying, and re rely upon them rather than upon politicians or fortune tellers for all your immediate and ultimate needs. 
So unfortunately, we see quite a lot of people who take refuge, you could say, either in politicians or fortune tellers or uh, those who do divinations and uh, do the mo and things like this. So do not put your faith and trust into these people. Put your faith and trust in to the three jewels and they eventually, you know, your everyday needs and ultimate needs will all be taken care of. Uh, finally, it says, according to your spiritual capacity, show others the significance of refuge in the three jewels and do not ever forsake your own refuge, not even in jest or to save your life. So even as a joke, never like never make a joke about your refuge or do not forsake the three jewels, not even as a joke or even um, you know, as an exchange for <laughs> saving your life and so forth. So maintain your refuge. And then with awareness of the need to avoid wasting time or mere on mere words, recite the following refuge formula three times each day and three times each night. So having contemplated the qualities of the three jewels, having understood all those principles of jewels, of the three jewels and going for refuge, then we recite those words three times morning and three times at night. Mm. Okay, so um, the in the Lam Rim, we have this very clear presentation that says that we go for refuge by knowing the qualities of the three jewels and knowing the differences uh, between them and also differences from non-Buddhists. Um, objects of refuge. Okay, so uh, having gone for refuge, there are um, specific benefits. So there are eight benefits. The first one is that we become Buddhists, but we become Buddhists if the refuge that we establish is genuine, is pure refuge. If our refuge is not genuine, then the mere restation, I go for refuge to Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, it doesn't matter how many times you repeat it, it doesn't make you a Buddhist. Okay, the second one is that having gone for refuge, you become a candidate for other vows. So refuge is like the foundation upon which you can then take other vows, Genyen vows, Gelong vows, Getsu vows, Bodhisattva vows, and so forth. And the third one is that you burn up a lot of uh, ne previously accumulated negativities and obscurations. Okay, we continue with the enumeration of the benefits of having gone for refuge. Number four is that you easily accumulate vast amount of merit because with refuge, even a small virtue that you, you create uh, very easily increases and becomes the causes for your enlightenment. The number five is you will not be harmed by humans and non-humans. So that's an interesting point, especially about harm coming from non-humans, because often we generate this um, almost like superstitious thoughts. Uh, oh, you know, something is harming me. Someone is harming me. And then we go out and we seek moors and divinations to find out who wants to harm us and so forth. So, of course, uh, the non-human beings are all around us. We cannot see, th see them, but we are constantly surrounded by them. Right? They are as many as insects, so millions and millions of them all around us. And if our merit is weak, they have the opportunity to cause harm. However, if we go properly for refuge, we are protected and they will not cause any harm. Okay, so that was number five. Number six, you will not fall into the lower migrations. Obviously, if you go for refuge properly and if you maintain the precepts and the commitments that come with refuge, it means you are avoiding the 10 non-virtuous actions. You avoid heavy negativity. So you do not create the causes to fall into the lower migrations. Number seven, you will effortlessly achieve the short and the long-term goals that you have, because as we say, there will be progress from, you know, you will go from good to better, better, better. And uh, uh, number eight, you will soon reach the state of enlightenment because you're accumulating very quickly all the necessary merit and so forth. Okay, so very important today, we talked about refuge. So we need to keep the precepts of refuge in our mind. But... When we talk about refuge, the main question is, where is my refuge? Where do I find this refuge? Is refuge found in, uh, let's say, the statues and so forth? 
um, that represent the Buddha? No, it's not found in the statues. Is refuge this mantra recitation that I constantly do? No, this is not refuge. Refuge is something that is found within your mind stream, without your within your mind. So refuge is a type of awareness. Refuge is um, this uh, a combination that we have for the fear let's say, of the lower migrations, and at the same time, the faith of conviction that the objects of refuge have the power to protect us from these types of fears. So refuge is a type of mental awareness existing within us. Mm -hmm. So today we talked about uh, the two causes of refuge that, as we say, is a fear and faith. Although we have obtained the precious human rebirth, we have to make sure that we make it meaningful by maintaining the ethics of abandoning the 10 non-virtuous actions. If you fear the lower migrations, then you must maintain this, this morality of abandoning the 10 non-virtuous actions. Then we talked about identifying the objects of refuge, and we say that these are the Buddha jewel, the Dharma jewel, and the Sangha jewel. And we must sincerely have faith in their qualities and go for refuge. The third one is the manner in which we go for refuge, which is through understanding their qualities. We talked about qualities of the body, of the speech, of the mind, the qualities of compassion uh, of the Buddha, of enlightened activities, and so forth. And finally, having gone for refuge, we need to understand the precepts uh, and uh, live by those precepts, maintain the precepts. So refuge is extremely important and is a very, uh, very good practice. As soon as you wake up in the morning, the first thing that you do, establish your refuge. Then you can engage in all other activities. Sometimes we forget and uh, before you know it, half the day has gone by and we have gone to the office, we've gone to the market, we've done this, we've done that and the other. And suddenly we remember, oh, I haven't even gone for refuge today. So don't uh, allow this to happen. Just always think I'm in the actual presence of the three jewels and uh, go for refuge sincerely and be protected like this. Any questions? Hi, Bola. My question is this. So in the refuge verses, it says it begins with uh, Namo Guru Be. So I want to ask, uh, in the offering of the food and drinks, uh, it says to the three jewels, should we then include the Guru at the beginning? Oh, okay. So Gisho is saying I will uh, give you my opinion when you make offerings you don't actually differentiate and you say oh, here's the lama here's the buddhas here's the bodhisattvas here's the kingdoms the deities and i have to make offerings separately to each you make offerings to the guru and uh, that actually becomes offering to all remember that verse from lama chopa who says you are my guru you're the buddha um you're the yidam you're the buddhas bodhisattvas uh, Dakinis and Dharma protectors. So if you have one guru who is teaching you the Dharma, you see that guru as the one representing all the Buddhas, all the Bodhisattvas, all the deities, all the Dakinis, all the Dharma protectors, and you offer to that guru. And by offering to that guru, you're making offerings to all the Buddhas, to all the Bodhisattvas, to all the deities, and so forth. Okay, so don't think that they are the different groups, and we have to offer to each one separately. The guru represents all of them, if you see the guru as the representative of all, and then you make good offering to all.